So I'm acutely aware of the fact that I stand between you and a beer or pizza, which is the other relevant uh, fact for this audience. I'm sure those are important. Uh, so I'll do my best to, uh, to keep this interesting. Uh, and also, uh, with a little bit of luck, I'll show you a live demo. So that's always sort of like, you know, uh, entertaining. Right, watch someone try to demo on stage. So I'll leave that for you as a little tidbit waiting out there. So I want to. I've been. I'm the CTO for Click. I've been with the company for about 10 years, um, and there's been a lot of change uh, in the BI industry. And I think that that is uh, accelerating yet again. And I think we're seeing yet another seismic shift in the industry. So I'm going to share with you, in some ways, a little bit dis divorced from Click, the company, what I see going on in the industry and the shifts that I see uh, occurring. I'll do that relatively quickly, and then hopefully show you some of those uh, concepts highlighted in the software. Um, so there's, a, I think, again, a kind of fundamental shift in the BI industry that we're really right in the midst of uh, today. Um, and uh, it's really a shift away from an IT-driven industry to a, a user-driven industry. So in the past, really was this expectation that IT organizations delivered uh, intelligence to users, and the users were the hapless recipients of typically a report. Um, and uh, that shift has really moved away, and that's also making some pretty fundamental shifts in how people buy and use the software, which is really what I'll focus on here. So the first big shift is data itself. So it used to be the case that we could rely on the fact that data was typically accessible over ODBC or from a database. But if you look at any new company today, and I bet any startup in this room, most, if, you know, if not 100%, certainly the vast majority of the data that you're working with is sourced, begins, and lives in the cloud. And that's changing how we need to think about doing analytics on that data. The second is we're shifting away from delivering answers to users and really delivering the ability to find your own answers or, or analytics to users. So this shift away from reports and towards analysis, this analytic-centric model is an important shift. Uh, third, from a buyer perspective, we're moving away from this uh, system centricity in terms of analytics where we start with, I, I run SAP, therefore I must have SAP analytics. No, uh, SAP is a great company, but starting from the perspective of the system and rather starting from the perspective of the business problem we're trying to solve. And, you know, I think prior uh, speakers are great examples of that. And fourth, uh, we're moving away from this kind of stack model to a platform model. And this is not, uh, this is no big insight. This is something we see in every industry, a move away uh, and where, where ultimately platform providers uh, are the victors. So if that's how the industry is shifting, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the other thing that we see uh, is this, the rise of data visualization as an industry. Um, and at some level, uh, part of the whole point of this uh, talk is to combat this very idea that visualization is the answer to all of our problems, right? So if, if we just had prettier pictures, then all things would be uh, solved. And I think, again, we've, we've heard some good speakers at the, uh, earlier really talking about this idea that data visualization or just looking at the data isn't a, uh, you know, so I took uh, you know, you know, uh, a great insight, which is cleaning up your data results in better decisions. Well, you know, that's a, that's a great insight. Um, uh, and, and I think this speaks to this idea that data visualization alone uh, doesn't solve uh, the challenge. So I thought I would uh, sort of think about what are the requirements that everyone in this room should have in the back of their mind as we start to build, uh, a, as an industry, a next generation of tools for users to be able to access and use data for decision making. Uh, and so, because I'm in New York, it's, it has to be a top 10 list, uh, so the top 10 uh, requirements for visual analytics. Um, so, number one, uh, if we're going to do this, it probably should result in co the correct answer. So it ought to cr calculate things uh, correctly. Um, and one of the challenges we have is that we try to resol um, resolve all of these questions into SQL queries. And when you resolve these questions into SQL queries, we often bump into uh, the challenges of expressing human questions in the form of select field name, where, star, group by, this kind of thing. Um, and in particular, typically these tools work on this idea of sort of uh, segmenting or reducing the data or slicing the data is often a word uh, uh, that we, we use, uh, or intersecting the data. And oftentimes, uh, from a 
question perspective, the interesting insights in the data are actually found outside of, of your selection, outside of your query. And so the more we think about trying to resolve these things into SQL queries, the more difficult it is to, uh, uh, to come up with the correct answer. It's a little hard to see, but if you can see on the graph, uh, you know, there are example here where there's a, a result on the green which wasn't found in the data set when you, when you made the SQL query, and so it's hidden from the answer, and that's where the insight is. The other is that we often are dealing with data at different levels of aggregation. And, and when you're dealing with multiple levels of aggregation, it's very common that you, you double count things, that you're looking at uh, products which are uh, grouped into multiple categories. And so creating the correct answer to these things and expressing that in SQL can be a very <coughs> difficult problem. So uh, focusing on ways to solve that problem is an uh, important requirement. The second uh, is um, uh, that we need to have a unified experience. And so the analogy I often draw here is with the, the Macintosh computer. So if you look back in history, um, when people looked at the Mac 20 years ago, they said, this is a great piece of hardware. It's a great operating system. The real path to success is to break the two apart. You should license the operating system to other hardware providers, and potentially, you know, Apple could have made hardware for other people. You have to be a little older to, to have this memory. Uh, today, this is largely debunked because everyone knows that the great value of a Mac is the fact that the operating system and the hardware come together, and they work together really well in stark contrast to the PC. And so, you know, we think there's a very similar concept here in terms of BI, which is this tight marriage between user interface and calculation. And, in fact, you hear the the analogy to the Macintosh reflected in a lot of startups and a lot of companies who say, I focus on you know, great calculations, and my demo is a command prompt and a SQL query. Right? And you see other people say, no, 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 I'm all about great, you guys have a whole series on design. So I'm all about the design, I don't care how you get me the data. And our view here is that no, in fact, the, the, the requirement here is really to bring these two worlds together, and you, you can't have one uh, without the other, or maybe sl slightly more generously, the real value comes when you bring the two uh, together. So number three uh, is uh, embedded best practices. And so the idea here is uh, that if we're going to build great uh, analytics, if we're going to let users answer questions, we can't let them uh, stab themselves in the leg. So we need to, to give them guide rails and go uh, guideposts to have them create best practice uh, visualizations, best practice answers to questions. And the answer to this cannot be a book. And with all due respect to people like Stephen Few, who've written great books, the idea is to encode the book in the software. And so that it, when the user does the stupid thing, the result is something that's actually correct and not uh, rely on them to have read the book and done the right thing. So data visualization without guide rails uh, again, that's like stabbing yourself in the leg. Here the idea is we want to give people a path towards uh, a best practice and really embed that uh, in the software itself. Fourth requirement is uh, flexibility. So traditionally in the business intelligence world, we've thought about this as we build schema, we deliver schema to a hapless user, and that allows them to you know, always calculate things uh, correctly. And of course, inevitably in that world, what happens is the user comes back and says, great that you've defined this hierarchy for me, I'd like it the backwards, or I'd like it this way, or I want this data, um, you know, I want to start here, not there. And this sort of problem confounds most uh, data analytics and uh, uh, projects. Um, and so I think one of the great innovations of Hadoop is this idea of schema on read, but that's not realized through to the, front, to the front end, to the user itself. And so this idea of flexibility from a data modeling perspective is a key requirement for as we think about making uh, analytics available to users in a way that lets them answer questions uh, more quickly and easily. So number five uh, is uh, search. And this may be a little counterintuitive since we're asking about, we're thinking about visual analytics, and ag analytics is really about aggregation, right, and charts and graphs. Uh, but if Google has trained uh, everyone in this room, and better than everyone in this room, has really trained the world, that the way you start any business question is with a, you know, with a search box. And so this idea that we need to have a search-driven interface is a very important uh, concept for business users as they try to ask and answer questions with data. 
Uh, th this is a, an area where there's a great opportunity for innovation. Uh, and again, we think about something like transforming voice into meaning, as we saw earlier. This is a, that would be a core and fundamental uh, concept here. But generally speaking, the idea that users start most business questions from the perspective of a search is an important uh, requirement, one that one should think very carefully about, especially for those in the room who are practitioners who are thinking about delivering applications to users. Uh, rather than starting with a graph, starting with a search box it really brings users into the problem. So sixth uh, requirement is around performance and scalability. So we do a lot of user testing uh, at Click. And uh, one of the things we've noticed is that when a user waits more than about two seconds, two, two and a half seconds, they stop clicking. It's, it's not a linear fall off. It like goes off a cliff. Uh, so the moment you're forced to sit sort of going, you know, I wonder when, uh, you just stop clicking. And that's why reports are so, uh, you know, so, so loved uh, is because you don't have to wait, right? There's the report and you can have any answer to any question you want as long as it's this one. Um, and so this trade-off uh, between uh, having the questions that you want answered and waiting is, uh, you know, is a really important uh, underlying requirement. So a focus on performance and scalability, allowing many users to access the system at once and to be able to ask, ask and answer questions. Uh, so uh, speaking for Click for a moment, uh, we've solved this problem by leveraging memory. Obviously, the major constraint with memory is how much data you can uh, store in memory and how you can process in memory. So we think the answer is really a hybrid approach where you have some data uh, in memory uh, and some data that you access live. Also, it's uh, uh, fairly clear that the technology here is evolving. So technologies like SSD are improving uh, uh, relative to um, spinning disks and even relative uh, to memory. So there's a lot of room for innovation here. But the, this fundamental trade-off between the user clicking, i.e. asking and answering questions and performance is an important one. So th it's also often the case that when we think about uh, user-driven analytics and visualization that we think that must be the opposite of governance and manageability. Right? That's clear, right? Because this is all about empowering users and nothing's less empowering than you know, someone from IT telling you what you can and can't do. In fact, we see the exact opposite that users are actually asking for data that they can trust. It doesn't mean they don't want the data on their desktop, but they want the combination of data that I can control and data that I can trust and manage and know is, is true. It's not that they don't want um, to, uh, you know, it's not that they desire export to Excel for some fundamental reason. They make good with that when they have no better alternative. So if we can give people a framework for governance and manageability, that can actually respect the requirements of our organizations and actually empower users to make better decisions. So we think that these things are not necessarily in conflict. In fact, it's a fundamental requirement uh, for the future. Eighth uh, is it has to be open. So we want open data for sure, but we also want a whole set of rich APIs and integration capabilities to make a, a platform like this one that fits into work you're doing. Or to say this a slightly different way, to, to believe that what we're going to solve from a platform perspective is going to meet every requirement of any customer who ever walked through the, the, the door is silly. And rather to imagine building a set of artifacts that a community like this can build into a whole range of applications that are relevant for your users and your use cases. So we think that's an important requirement. A little aware of time here. Uh, so number nine uh, is data itself. So traditionally, we, when we think about the problem of user-driven analytics and asking and answering questions, we assume the data. Right? Imagine that we have this, this data set, hopefully downloaded from Crowdflower because it was open. Uh, imagine we have this data, and then uh, some smart person prepared it and made it available for me for uh, analysis. And in fact, what, we, what we're increasingly seeing is that data is itself is at the center of decision making. And there's a very tight loop between the data and the question we're trying to answer. And this is, when you talk to users, you see this, they actually articulate it this way. They'll say, I like this analysis. Wouldn't it be great if I could see it with this other piece of data. And so the, tightening that loop between data and analysis is really going to be an important requirement uh, for the future. 10 
uh, is uh, this is really about mobile and, and cloud. So the idea that we have a difference or a differentiation between doing analytics on my PC and doing it on my iPad uh, is, is silly and false, that in fact these are actually the same thing. Uh, I always laugh when you see vendors who create mobile versions of their application. No one wants a mobile version. They want the same version they had on their PC to be the one that works on their mobile device, to be the one that works on their big screen like this. Um, and cloud uh, fits into the same. Uh, no one wants a cloud version of their application. They want a version that runs on-premise, and they want one that runs in the cloud, and there should really be no difference between those two. And because you've been such a great audience, and I know there's a pizza waiting for you, you got a free one, uh, no extra charge, uh, although I will maybe demand first dibs on the pizza. Does that feel? I don't know. Maybe not. So number 11, uh, that often when we think about uh, user-driven uh, analytics and visual uh, uh, an analysis, we think about the analysis. But we need to remember that we are human beings. We're not computers. And ultimately, human beings uh, tell stories. And so much of what we do in the context of our work life uh, isn't actually doing analysis. It's telling the story that the analysis, uh, the, the results of that analysis. And so building frameworks and tools for making it possible to tell a story is a really important uh, requirement. So there you go, top, now 11, requirements for the future of uh, visual analytics. I, I know I'm pushing my, uh, my luck here. Perfect. Everyone likes to see someone try to do a demo. So um, <laughs> it's really most demos actually turn out to be a test of Wi-Fi. That's really you know the most of the demo is that. Uh, so uh, this is our product. So I'll, uh, I'll sort of start from this perspective. Um, the uh, so what we're looking at is what we call uh, the hub, and the hub is really where a user would begin uh, their uh, analysis and. Um, uh, it sort of organizes all of the workbooks of analysis that they're working on. So here's a, a sort of demo application that I like to show. Um, and you know, the important idea here, of course, is that this is something that's very visual. So users are, uh, you know, we always like to say sex sells. It, it, is, it is a case that you want something that's visually appealing that sort of draws you in. But it's not just pretty pictures for the sake of pretty pictures. So let me give you a good example uh, on the uh, right here with this bar chart. Uh, the idea of uh, details and overview in a compact space. So on the right, uh, or uh, on, on the left, rather, um, you see the bar chart here that gives you the details of the product categories. But on the right, you see the overview of the full set of data. And so in one space, the user is giving both the details and the overview. And so you can see things like uh, outliers. So we can take advantage of the human being's ability to sort of capture data. This also, you can see the use of color. And that, that the Cloudflare example is a brilliant one. It turns out that a large percentage of the population uh, is colorblind. In particular, males are red, green colorblind. And the use of red for bad and green for good in corporate dashboards, uh, with many senior executives being males, you might ask the question whether there's a correlation between corporate performance and the use of. <laughs> but we don't ask those kinds of questions. Uh, instead, we use uh, color saturation as a mechanism of showing difference, because it turns out that color saturation is a uh, much better uh, example, a much better way of, uh, of seeing difference. Uh, and uh, all right, so shifting gears uh, a little bit uh, here, we, we uh, had this idea of search as a primary interface for asking uh, and answering questions. So if I was a, a user of this system and I wanted to, and if I was going on a trip to Akron, Ohio, right, and I wanted to know what this business is doing in Akron, search is the natural place to start. So what I don't think in my head is I wonder if we have a data field on, you know, city and whether I can go find that and how do I, you know, do that query. I just come in here and I type Akron. And when I type Akron, the system's smart enough to know, wait a second, there is a field called city with the field value Akron, and I can go ahead and look to see what's going on in Akron. And important here is the concept of interactivity. So as I make a selection like Akron, I see immediately that there are two sales reps in Akron, Ken and Lisa, and that we've sold a variety of different products uh, in Akron. But that's actually not the, the, you know, the typical thing. What, what you really see is people come in here and they say, I'm uh, the sales rep for Akron. Uh, and I'm interested to see if we've had anyone who's uh, sold beer. And it turns out there is no relationship between beer and Akron. So you could either select Akron or you could select beer, but you can't select both. In contrast, if you said something like breakfast, you can see that there is 
uh, a relationship between breakfast foods and Akron. In fact, it's Ken who sold breakfast foods in Akron. So this idea of always seeing all of the data all of the time tied with a search interface we think is an important uh, sort of uh, requirement. Last thing I'll show you uh, very quickly is embedding best practices. So if uh, let's go ahead and create something new here. Um, so uh, I'm going to create a, a quick scatter plot. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and look at inventory levels uh, and lead time for our products. And now I'm going to make uh, a mistake. So, uh, you know, a typical thing to do here would be to say, I'm interested in our inventory levels and our lead times by product. But, and uh, the reality is there are over Eight, around 8,000 products in the data set. So what would happen in a traditional, like an Excel, right, is you'd get a scatter plot with 8,000 points on it, which would be like a big blue dot. It wouldn't tell you very much. And so this is a good example where we've embedded in the tool a clustering algorithm to look at the 8,000 points and sort of group them up and show you the hot spots in the data. And you know you can do the obvious thing, right? You can start zooming in, and as you zoom in, we're going to reveal the details until we get to a point where we can actually show you the details, right? But to build something like that in a traditional tool would involve understanding how to build an aggregate, how to map the aggregate to a detail, and how to create the zooming effect. Right. And that's uh, very difficult. This is a good example of embedding a, a best practice. So, and the demo mostly worked, with one minor exception. So there you go. Thanks, Alan Anthony. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to open directly to people for one or two questions, see if we have any. You guys just love beer and pizza, don't you? A lot of pizza. <laughs> All right, one volunteer. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Do you plan to integrate uh, NLP into your product, the natural language processing? There's other, other tools like Data RPM, which are there. They're not as good as yours, but they have the natural language processing. Do you plan to integrate in your product's roadmap eventually? Manik Patil. Yeah, so natural language processing. Uh, the, the, the simplest answer is yes. The, the longer answer is processing the language isn't the hard. I mean, that's a hard part. It's not one we're going to do. Dealing with the language once you have it is something we're obviously very interested in. Um, hold, hold on. Hold. Do you have any modules or experience putting in predictive analysis? Because that's an amazing interface for maybe throwing something against the wall and seeing where it fits. So, the, uh, so predictive analytics in the context of this is a. It's, Precisely, and so the, you see a similar concept in the scatter plot. So the, what the scatter plot is doing is uh, uh, is clustering algorithms, uh, but you could imagine a similar concept with a uh, say a line chart over time, and then have it predict out three periods or n periods, and have it do its best, giving a good uh, display of uh, the error rates of a, a prediction. The important idea here is in the scatter plot, you didn't know what clustering algorithm I used, and so there's always room, especially in this room. For people who want to build really sophisticated algorithms for whatever it is, clustering or prediction or whatever. Um, but there's also room for surfacing that in front of the user in a way which makes it really dead simple. And so you don't have to know what clustering algorithm we used for the scatter plot. You just know that it kind of worked. And you don't have to go through you know, seven months of programming to get the experience. And again, those are not in competition with each other. They actually, I think, ultimately very supportive of each other. Great. Last question of the night. The question better have the word pizza and beer in it. OK, pizza to start off. <laughs> anyway, quickly, um, who's had the greatest uptake with this? Perhaps verticals or functional areas where you're getting the highest um, usage and perhaps other areas you're looking to exploit? Yeah, um, so you know, we do see a fairly broad uh, adoption uh, you know, across industries. And I would say, the, uh, generally speaking, where there are more knowledge workers and more uh, use of data, more data-driven industries are typically uh, bigger, uh, bigger users. I'd also say, uh, and this is a, your question uh, is, is a good one in the sense that we're talking about a shift in the BI industry away from a report-centric model to more user and visual uh, analysis. That is not an even shift. 
So uh, there are certainly industries which lag, and there are certainly industries which are pushing the forefronts of, of that shift. So uh, you know, regulated industries are way behind. Even financial services, God forbid, is a little bit further behind. Uh, but you see other industries, uh, you know, retail is an example, pushing you know, mobile decision making out to store managers are really pushing the forefront of this stuff. So I, I do think there's a, 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 ver a variation in the adoption. So it's a, it's a good question. All right. That's all the time we have. Thank you yep. so much for being here. Appreciate it.